quick perfection. Okay. Before we begin, any general questions or observations? Just a very quick question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, oh, yeah, excuse me. Okay. Um, in case I should ever not be able to make it in person, what is it? How do I link into? Uh, what is it? Faith asks, in case uh, you can't, we can't make it in person at some point. How do we get the recording? And um, I, I have Sarah. How do we get the recording? Sarah, what are you you can email the office and I will send you the link. Okay. It's also cbtzoom.org. So, if you want to log in live, yeah. it's cbtzoom.org. Okay. All right. If you want the recordings, no, no, that's different. Um, maybe okay, so, we can add a link on the weekly email. All right. To our YouTube um, page. But, so, I, I'll ask, also ask this any um, observations from the world of religion this week before we begin or dive in? Let's talk about Just to sort of get our mind moving. Upload them to the YouTube page. If not, no worries. You can jump right into it. All right, we'll just jump into it. Okay, so I want to start. I need to go back to check. Oh, because I didn't get it. Hold on one moment. There's some. There's some thoughts. Go on. Um. So I I'd like to start tonight by going over just some. Uh. Basically, we want to rather than talking about the history, which is what we did last week, I want to talk about the um, cultural and ritual and um, religious and theological attributes of the Messianic movement. And keeping in mind, this is a very diverse movement, right? Like I said last week, the week before, we are not talking just about the Jews for Jesus, who pretty much are, you know, if you look at most of their practice, it's pretty Christian. Um, Within the larger umbrella of Messianic Judaism, right? Kind of quote, within that larger umbrella, we have a very wide array of practices and engagements with Jewish traditions, with Hebrew terms, and with also Jewish theological concepts as well. So one of the biggest things, of course, is the use of, or the engagement with the Sabbath, right? Specifically beginning on Friday night and then going to through Saturday. This is not exclusively a Jewish and then by proxy a Messianic Jewish uh, phenomenon. The Seventh-day Adventists do something similar as well. They don't pretend necessarily to be Messianic. They are their own Christian denomination. Uh, so Saturday Sabbath is not only, does not only belong to Jews, but Messianic Jews tend to engage in a tradition or tend to approach at least the time frame in a traditional way, which is to say that Friday night is the beginning of the Sabbath, and then that goes through to sunset the next day. Now, what they do on Shabbat is probably, in many cases, going to be very, very different from the traditional Jewish uh, synagogue, whether we're talking about Orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist, Sephardi, Mizrahi, Ashkenazi, whatever the case may be. It's going to look pretty different. Um, but yeah, this is what we're going to go through for the next few slides. Daryl. Something along this line, some churches that clearly aren't trying to pretend to be Jewish have services on Saturdays as well as Sundays, so people can pick and choose when they want to go to uh, even some Catholic churches, I think, do it on Saturdays. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Um, there is there's no hard, fast rule in Christianity that the Sabbath has to happen on Sunday, or even that the Sabbath need to be observed. So as um, the United States uh, and American culture in particular has become, uh, basically, these marriages work more now and work erratic hours, churches have responded by establishing other worship times. So if you want to worship in a Christian way, you do not need to worship on the Sabbath. There is no commandment that you observe the Sabbath. I mean, aside from the command of it's both that we follow that are it's not, but remember Christianity breaks away from following this not, right? At least in a strict way. So you don't need to achieve salvation in a Christian sense. Um, in order to, uh, by, uh, you don't need to do that, or rather, you don't need to follow the mitzvot to do that, so you don't need to practice the Sabbath. You can just go and worship whenever. So that's one reason, but there, the, the, the impetus for that is to respond to American business practices, right? To respond to American capitalism, basically. I was, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but I mean, this is kind of how it's been. We look at like Max, uh, uh, Max Weber writing about the Protestant spirit in American capitalism, right? 
This is there, there long has been a fusion of capitalism and Protestant ethos, right? This is something, and no business in particular. But anyway, that's the answer here. That's the reason. Okay. But I said I wasn't going to go into too much history. I want to talk about the actual attributes of this movement. So one of the things that congregations and messianic congregations and organizations will do is that they're going to use language that is familiar to Jews. And as normative Jews, when we look at that, this is one of this, and you go into like online Jewish spaces, this is one of those areas where we'll look at that and say, uh-huh, they're doing this because they are imposters trying to fool us in us Jews into thinking that they that that you know they're authentically Jewish, right? And and there is an element of that to be sure, but it's not all that. But let me give the uh, mic to Ben. So I was also looking at that point and um, having thoughts along a similar line, like, oh, this feels like a trap. Um, my question is, like, as someone who barely knows any Hebrew and um, isn't super fluent in Christian ideas either, how do I tell, like, that this is, like, a messianic use of Hebrew? Like, then David looks kind of obvious, but the rest of them... I could easily be fooled by them. Yeah. Uh, that's an excellent question. How can you tell? So when I first learned about Messianic Judaism back when I went at that, I had there was that, that nifty seminar when I was a teenager, and they're like, stay away from them. Um, one of the things they said was that it's in Hebrew, the congregation in Hebrew, but they're super, super long, huge Hebrew phrases. That's what you can tell. It's not like Temple Beth something. And that's no longer the case, right? That's no longer the case. Now, if you don't, if you don't know, you may look at these and think that they are just, you know, that, they, that these are uh, traditional Jewish congregations. So you have to sort of read into what's there. And if you don't know Hebrew, this could be a pitfall. So I'll, I'll address why it could be a pitfall and why that's not necessarily something to worry as much about. But mainly, the way you can tell, Ben David it means son of David. And there is a long passage in the Christian scriptures, in the book of Luke in particular, I think, that draws the lineage from Jesus through his father Joseph to David, king of Israel, in order to set up his messianism, right? right? To set up Jesus as the Messiah. This is a major part of Christian scripture and a major part of major part of Christian theology. So to call your congregation Ben David, son of David, you are specifically referring to the Messiah. Specifically, whether that Messiah is Jesus or someone like Bar Kokhba, that's who you're referring to, essentially. Um, the other, so Shuva Israel, right? Um, Shuva from to Shuva to return to be redeemed, and so it means Israel redeemed, right? Israel redeemed. This is not something. This is not an idea that's alien to Judaism, but it means something very different in Judaism than it means in Christianity. And Christianity, what it means is that the remnants of the nation, uh, the nations of the people of Israel will eventually recognize Jesus as the Messiah, and at that point they will be redeemed. And so that's what it's referring to. Um, Adat halal, halal means like holy, Adat, that refers to a community, right? I forget, I, I, I forget what, the, what the term, what the word Adat means. But it ultimately is a reference to purity. And so coming what's coming through there is a heavy emphasis on purity culture, which is really, really big in Pentecostalism. And at some point in another class, maybe we'll do a uh, standalone lesson on purity culture. The thing is, it doesn't have much to do with Judaism. So I mean, that means people of, but in Messianic, it refers to a flock of animal. It also means yeah. flock. Oh, okay. So Jen, Jenna, Jen, thank you, Jenna. Jenna says a dot means um, like a people or people of, but specifically in Messianic, in this Messianic culture, it refers to a flock. And the idea of a flock and being led by a shepherd, that is something that is very, very common within Christian tradition, right? And so what it's saying is like a holy flock or a pure flock, which means those followers of the shepherd Jesus Again, drawing a connection to David, who was also a shepherd. Those followers of the shepherd Jesus uh, who are holy, and they are made holy, they are washed clean in the sacrifice of Jesus. So that language of purity is very, very big in evangelical and Pentecostal communities in particular, and that root in Pentecostalism is really coming through here. It's really showing through. But if you speak to, and I want again, I want to 
sort of bracket out the Jews for Jesus, that one aggressive group, and other groups like them. Bracket them out. And if you speak to a messianic congregation and say, why are you called this? You're going to get a couple of responses. One response is that it speaks authentically, within their own authenticity, it speaks authentically to their theology, right? Of course they would use Hebrew. They, they follow the mitzvot in their understanding, right? They follow the mitzvot. They are part of, in their again, to their minds, to the Jewish tradition. So of course they would use Hebrew. And if they're going to use Hebrew, they're going to use terms and phrases in Hebrew that resonate with their theology. Why would they use a non-Messianic Jewish idea? Because they are Messianic. And Jesus and belief in Jesus is central to their practice. So that's one answer you're going to get. The other answer you'll get is that they do have, and this is true, there are ethnically Jewish congregants who join these movements. Not many, not a lot of them, by any stretch of the imagination. Like I said last week, we are literally to secularism. But those who join, those who join, um, are comforted by the use of Hebrew. They're comforted by it. And they also are, they become like Christian believers, so it fuses their new theology with their old cultural connection. So is it meant to be subterfuge? Is it meant to trick Jews? By and large, I would say no. But like Genevieve said, what if you are Jewish and you don't have a connection to Hebrew and you don't know? Which is true of many, many, many Jews. I'm a Jewish professional, and I forgot what the word adopt meant, right? So, and, and I don't speak Hebrew, right? And I my my biblical reading level is, you know, it's it's passable for a Reformed Jew, but it's not perfect. So, what about those Jews who are Jews but are not connected to the Hebrew language? What do they do then? So, yeah, there's definitely a risk that someone could go into a Messianic congregation and think that it's a synagogue and think everything's A-OK, -okay, right? Absolutely. Most Jews who have any background in Jewishness, right, they're going to go in there and they're going to hear a whole lot of stuff about Jesus right away. And they're either going to hear, like, he'll be inserted into the sermons or they're going to read from the Christian Gospels or there will be some sort of tradition or custom that, that some of the Jewish would be very unfamiliar with. So, for instance, if the congregation is more Pentecostally oriented, people might engage in speaking in tongues or a Holy Ghost shout before they, uh, you know, do Kiddush and Motsi. And, yeah, holy, I'll get to what a Holy Ghost shout is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I will definitely get to a Holy Ghost shout. Um, so you may see you may see something like that. And someone who is raised Jewish but doesn't isn't familiar with the uh, language or Hebrew, they they you're going to see that and they're going to be like, mm, that's not kosher, right? Yeah. And that that's definitely that's going to happen. Now, are there people who go to these things and then have a religious experience? And they're like, you know what? I thought it was regular synagogue, but this is how Jesus found me. Yeah, of course that's going to happen. But again, the number of people that fall into this form of, uh, of religion and sort of approach, become, you know, enter into the world of Christianity through these congregations is tiny compared to the number of reform, conservative, reconstructionist, secular, and yes, even Orthodox Jews who just fall away to secularism or to some sort of general spirituality or something like that. Who then a few generations down the road, like one, two, three generations down the road, their descendants just, you know, become Catholic or whatever the case may be, right? So secularism, but I'm, I'm not arguing here that we should all like, you know, put on our CC and like, you know, be fully orthodox. That's not the argument that I'm making here. I'm just saying that secularism does a lot more, if you want to think of it as damage, it does a lot more damage to the continuity and the cohesiveness of the Jewish community than Messianic Judaism does, at least in my humble opinion. Okay, so... Here, but I have this other, I have this, and I think this is worth um, addressing. I have this other point here. It's not subterfuge. I don't think it's subterfuge, but it's an appropriation. So in order to ask whether or not it's appropriation and the other stuff we're going to look at today, whether or not that's appropriation, I'm going to first ask the class 
What is cultural appropriation? You hear this term thrown around all the time. So I, <laughs> and I'm going to give the mic to Alexis, who was so enthusiastic. So take it away, Alexis. Cultural appropriation, a perfect example is my instructional assistant, who I was uh, last year when it was on the holy days, and I was just starting to learn. She uh, was telling me about how her pastor did did a Rosh Hashanah uh, thing and was dipping dipping uh, apples and honey and feeding them to her congregants. So I was kind of like, and I like just looked at her and I just went, "That's cultural appropriation." And and she, yeah, like so, a that's... sacrament. He's like feeding, kind of. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was kind of creepy. So then I asked that that was like a sacrament, and I will I'll, I'll come back to that. But here you go, John. I, I mean to um, explain it outside of an example, which will not be shaded. <laughs> what is um, to take from a culture that you were not born into or adopted into? Yeah. Okay. Um, and one element of cultural appropriation is the question of who benefits from it. Mm -hmm. um, like, if you're sharing with a culture, like with their permission, um, that's different from like you stealing their ideas and then making money off of it. I want more. Yes. For, uh, an example that's not Jewish would be like, since I work in a um, Latino neighborhood and we do day of the dead things would be me doing my own day of the dead stuff, but but me respecting them and asking them about their altars and asking them about about their and having uh and celebrating theirs without having my own altar, that's not cultural appropriation. It would be cultural appropriation if I put up my own altar. That would be cultural appropriation. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad you did Diodo de los Muertos as an example. Like I, when I teach uh, race and religion in America, that's an that we talk about that. Um, and, and yeah, this is not. I want to. This is not to uh, the um, the Latin American communities in California in particular have these like really huge public celebrations of this particular festival, and like whether it's at Olvera Street or Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and like they open it up to everyone to come to. The issue would be showing up in like Calaveras Street, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. My next door neighbor passed away about five years ago, and. Um, she believed all the time in Jesus. I don't know what, what denomination she was, but she was always talking about Jesus to me and trying to get me to believe in Jesus when I went with her. And But I had a good time with her. We were friends, and we go to movies together. We go out to get, we, we, we join together in things that we love to. If you could understand that, it's a little hard to figure it out. But but she was my next door neighbor, and every so often she'd give me a gift. Now I thought these were beautiful gifts. Daryl figured it out. I didn't. I didn't know what it was. But by the freeway was a big thing. It looked like a church. I don't know what it was. Do you remember the name of it? She, she from the plaza, and she. And they sell these things, beautiful artifacts, gifts to give to your friends, your relatives. And Katie May, my next door neighbor, Katie May, she'd give me these things. And I thought, I know oh, this is really cool. I like a mezuzah, look like a mezuzah, I look like a Jewish star. Daryl said, it isn't. It, no, don't believe that she's giving you anything. It's a joke. It's baloney. It wasn't. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm making a different choice. Cultural, cultural appropriation. I mean, maybe I'm pushing this, but I 50 some years ago, in the 60s and 70s, most of the people who were a bagel world were Jews, and most people who weren't Jews had no idea what a bagel is. I'm willing to bet you 99 percent of the population today knows what a bagel is. Is that cultural appropriation? No. No, no because no. that's yeah. Uh well, did you want to no, question? Question? so um American. Yeah, so Judaism, so I think this leads to a, a point that I want to make is that, that Judaism occupies an interesting sort of in between space, and Jewishness occupies an interesting in between space. We can look at someone who is not 
uh, Mexican American painting their face with stone makeup on you know, those murals and saying, okay, this is a problem, this is problematic, right? Because it dilutes and diminishes the importance of this particular culture. But Judaism, and, and when we talk about race and Judaism, sometime in a few months, we'll dive more into this. But Judaism has become part of the, at least in recent years, mainstream, quote unquote, not unquote, but mainstream white culture. And so things like bagels have become accepted as part of the mainstream culture. Having said that, there are sort of like weird little spaces like bagel bites, right? So, um, or... Bagel flavor stuff? Yeah. But, but, but like the point, I'll look at the bites in a moment. My point is that one of the issues with um, cultural appropriation in about Judaism is that it's sort of a weird in between space sometimes. It's sometimes not all that kind of dry. Let me give the bite to faith and then draw. Yeah. Well, by the same token, you could say that Krepla, um, our, our uh, raviolis, I mean, she's, each, each nation has its own version of food. <laughs> but wait, something else I wanted to say, and I, this has been the form of a question to you, Sean. In the Catholic uh, religion, uh, there are priests where there are can, can you consider that? Uh, like the, they were, it looks like they downloaded them. They had, I see on Father Brown, he kisses his whatever they put his paw, yeah. and before he puts it on. Yeah. I mean, these garments, is that cultural? So, no, no, that, that wouldn't be. I think that there we have to be really discerning when we talk about um, what constitutes this. And remember that the problem is that Judaism and Jewishness is both an ethnicity and a religion and a culture. Hmm. And there's a political component when we talk about like, or a social political component. We talk about like Israel, it's a, not the nation of Israel, but Israel, the people of Israel is a nation. And then also there's this problem with Judaism, anti-Semitism and particularly being racialized, right? So it's really difficult with Judaism. And what I'm gonna sort of walk us back to in a moment is that it's, there's a gray, there are gray areas that Messianic Judaism exploits oftentimes. And it's really hard to determine what is and what is not cultural appropriation. The things you mentioned, no, those are aspects of just 2,000 years of syncretism. And when we're talking about a religion, the problem is, when is it syncretism? When is it appropriation? Like, so for instance, when people, uh, when, when people who aren't Hindu, like throw color powder at each other on Holi, which is a holiday around the time of Purim, um, that is oftentimes seen as cultural appropriation, but is it a cultural appropriation to engage in yoga? Well, some people say absolutely it is, but many people, including many Hindus, say it's not. So these are not cut and dry things. You cannot categorize them. Uh, I, I guess it kind of, it, you know it when you see it, right? You've got to see if it passes as the SNP test. To briefly answer a que question there Excuse that you me. had there, um, I would say, like, um, appropriation versus syncretism tends to be like if it's a dominant society that's being borrowed from I read. something like that. <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I wanted to offer a couple more examples, like especially related to food and also not Was there in non-Jewish ways. Like um, no, it's just I read. Okay. You see a lot of people who are like, oh, um, is eating sushi as a white person cultural appropriation? And it's like obviously the answer is no. But if to use the example for what I would say is appropriation in something like that is like Chef Rick Bayless, who went to Mexico and decided to do high class Mexican cuisine yeah. and basically making hundred dollar dishes of traditional Mexican food. Like that. So, yeah, oh, oh, or <laughs> or like also like when it comes to like what it's appropriation if a white influencer puts a bindi on their forehead, but it's yeah. not appropriation if you're invited to an Indian wedding and you and you wear a traditional Indian garb. That's being respectful. Yes, well, exactly. It is being respectful, but you're being respectful under like the rules that they've set within their family, right? That's that's the that's the key thing. And um sometimes the family Provide this yes, true. And that, that would be a time that it's like appropriate. But if you were just sort of go out on your own and just do it for fun or the Halloween costume, that it becomes disrespectful, right? 
Yeah, exactly. Remember but, that people but, can't hear what Alexis says that. Uh, so repeat what you're Alexis, saying. Alexis said it would be like coming into the synagogue and wearing uh, a yarmulke, right? Wearing a kippah. Um, you're invited in to do that. And so uh, essentially, whether we're talking about on a, on, a, on a low scale, a small scale, like coming to a synagogue, or a large scale, like a huge community, um, a huge public community, a lot of the time, what, what, what constitutes appropriation or doesn't constitute appropriation is based on power, the power that the community has within the society, who the dominant culture is, and so on and so forth. I don't want to get too caught up in all of this um, because we will talk about it when we talk about race and Judaism uh, further down the road in this class. So we'll, we'll come back to it for sure. I do want to say a really, really quick funny story though. Um, a number of years ago, I was at a coffee shop and I overheard this conversation. There was this woman who was sitting with, I think of her parents, they were an older couple. Um, and she said, this was down in Lake Laguna Miguel. She said, oh my God, I had the most amazing thing ever. It was a sushi bagel. And her parents go, what? What is that? And she says, it was like a Philadelphia roll put on a bagel. For those of you who don't know what a Philadelphia roll is, I'm sure most of you do, what this is, is um, it's a sushi roll with uh, salmon sashimi, and, or with salmon, with um, avocado, and cucumber usually, and also uh, cream cheese, Philadelphia cream cheese, right? So it's a few, yeah, it, it actually is a good example of like a fusion of culture um, because it originally comes from lox and bagels. Yes. What this individual was describing was a bagel with lox. So it was a bagel that had cream cheese on it and salmon sashimi. And they, that's how she described it. And they were like, wow, that sounds really interesting. So is the Philadelphia role of cultural appropriation? I mean, it depends on the amount of power that the community has. Yeah. So it, it, it's 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 a yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, Lance Pinkham says, is there a difference between religious borrowing and religious appropriation? And the answer to that is sometimes there is, and sometimes there not. It depends again on the level of power that the religious community who is being borrowed from has in the society. The Jewish community in America, particularly the Ashkenazi community, um, tends to again until recent years. Uh, has been pretty much been accepted as, as, you know, normatively American. Therefore, has social power. This is not, not an anti-Semitic like, trope that Jews have power. It just means that, right? It just means that we have more power than some other marginalized communities. And so, like, does it actually harm us, really harm us when we are appropriated? I mean, it's a great, it's hard to say. There is really no one answer, one way or the other. And I know that that is not satisfying. And, and oh well, but because of that, it's not like when we engage with messianic Judaism, you know, these same questions come up. And then the second, I know that wasn't a satisfying answer, I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and Barbara asks, I think part is in the intent. If I eat soul food, I'm enjoying their culture. If I don't have a soul food restaurant purporting to be my family's re re recipe, now I'm appropriated. And yes, I think that's true. And also, if you are benefiting from something financially, when the culture that you took it from is not gaining from that financial benefit. So think, to use your example, crap law, right? Let's say like Bobby makes this amazing crap law and somebody who is not Jewish goes over there and he said, and they're like, this is amazing. I'm going to go to my restaurant. I'm going to call it crap latch or something. And, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to add, I'm going to add like, I'm going to add like, yeah, uh, I'm going to make it with pork, right? Or something like that. And I'm going to sort of do a dumpling basically, right? The whole other issue, maybe that. But anyway, uh, that would be, and then they're making money off of it and Bobby doesn't see any of that money, right? Then, that is cultural appropriation, right? Yeah. I think most of the food yeah, that we can here is Jewish. You know, we've all been to four delis on the boat. But you think about boars, we build the fish. You think about um, falafel. They aren't Jewish hmm. because they're East, either Eastern European or Mediterranean. You'll find other cultures uh, have the same food. Yeah, so have the same. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So food's complicated. <laughs> And trace it back to a particular country, Lenny, Borscht, Russia. Yeah, basically uh, trace all those maps. Yeah, the two, two, obviously two grandmothers, and one, everything was uh, noodles, and the other one was kasha because they came from different areas, and they 
appropriators. Yeah. Well, so I mean, but again, the, the, the so uh, they mentioned a bunch of like traditional Ashkenazi foods. The the the, the issue is whether or not non-Jews are marketing those and selling those, or and I'm going to come around to this probably not in this class, but soon. Uh, whether or not Jewish ideas or histories are being appropriated to create an identity. And this is ultimately the fear that Jews have over Messianic Judaism. Is Jewish culture and religion being utilized to harm Jews? And one of the issues that many Jews have with Messianic congregations is that, yes, they'll say, yes, it is because they're trying to convert us. I'm arguing, as a professor here right now, that that's not as much something to be concerned about, but, especially with the Messianic movement, but the appropriation of Jewish theologies and specifically Jewish history, which we'll get to in a little bit uh, more in depth, but the appropriation of that in, by, by specifically, not necessarily by Messianics, but by Christians, by evangelical Christians and Pentecostal Christians and Christian nationalists and sort of that robust masculine Christianity, that is a problem because what you'll increasingly see is things, uh, little statements that are like, well, I'm using the shofar because I'm grafted onto the tree of Israel and I'm a more authentic Jew anyway because Jesus was their Messiah and they rejected Jesus. And this is the type of language you see. I rarely see it in my work from Messianic Jews. I almost, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I rarely see it. I almost always see it increasingly over the past 10 years from evangelical, particularly white evangelical, Pentecostals and evangelical Christians. Yeah, so uh, Alexis mentioned that within um, uh, right-wing political movements, like especially like within like the uh, MAP movement, that you'll see people who bring shofars specifically, and what they're doing is they are using the shofar as a kind of um, uh, intimidating weapon almost. They're hearkening it back to the use of Joshua who marches around Jericho with the shofars and blow the shofars and the walls come and tumble it down to use the to quote the old gospel song. And uh, and yeah that's a form of appropriation because it gives it raises the idea in other Americans who aren't familiar with this that like Jews like ourselves um are okay with that kind of politics. Some of us are but not all of us are and it raises the idea that, among other Christians, that they have access to this type of ritual object that becomes, that, that in their in this, in this way, it becomes a political weapon, right? And it, gets, and it gets even, like, deeper and more insidious than that, but we're not quite there yet. I want to sort of steer us back to the language of Messianic and Messianic movement itself. Why do Messianic Jews ultimately use this type of language whether or not we see it as appropriate or not, they see what they're doing, theologically speaking, culturally speaking, as de-Hellenizing or re-Hebraizing, <laughs> the de-Hellenization or re-Hebraization of Christianity. So in this, there's like a recognition that they are practicing a form of Christianity. They feel, and this is similar to that like primitive Christianity we talked about, they feel what they're doing is making Christianity less Greek and thus more authentically Hebrew, um, and thus more in line with Jesus. Is there an online question? Jen? She just said it was a bad joke. You oh. made a bad joke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she said have a bad name for a restaurant. <laughs> All right. Okay. Say so, thanks, Barbara. <laughs> so, oh, here you go, Sharon. Explain why didn't I, why didn't I understand what Daryl was telling me when he's very shocked about it? But I didn't. I thought it was just a lovely gift from Amy May. But I opened up a few of them, expecting to see a little paper, the Shema or the Bahakta. No, the papers were all about Christianity and Jesus. He was right. Was she it. Jewish? No. Was she Jewish? No. She, no, not at all. Well, then why would we expect that? Why? Would, because she's giving me a gift. A Jewish a gift. A Jewish gift. And it wasn't. It, it wasn't. I misunderstood. I was going to send her a thank you. No, I decided not to. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so how... Oh, yeah, John. How, um, 
to touch upon the last slide a little bit. Um, Do we from, go back to the last slide? I think everyone wants to talk about the last slide. <laughs> well, it's uh, spicy. You did kind of jump over the, you don't uh, really the familiar language part there. Okay. Well, um, I mean, well like um, the, the first example, the Yeshua there, um, it reminded that, well, oh, two things. One, several years ago, someone had altered the Wikipedia page on the Amidah to say that the Yeshua in the Amidah was clearly a sign that it was, the Amidah was written by early Christians instead of Jews yeah. and stuff like that. But another thing, um, there's a sidur floating around the back of the, of the congregation where somebody, like, they wrote a note on another page, but they also clearly put Yeshua and Amidah in a box. Yeah, they they scribbled in the yeah, the word. Word. it means to be put in different yeah. 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 yeah this is clearly a Christian was in here and saw that and, and, and that, that would be an example of a type of albeit small cultural violence like absolutely it is a desecration okay. however small of our sacred text now they were probably thinking two things they were probably thinking like well we write in our Bibles all the time which is true if you're Pentecostal you're evangelical you're always writing your Bible. And other forms of Protestant as well. Um, and they're also thinking. Would they write public Bibles? Yes. Okay, so it's not. It's so the Alexis, Alexis asked if they would write in something. Wait, what do you mean in public? Well, like that belongs to the congregation. I can understand about in personal Bibles, but would they write in, in congregation? So Alexis asked if they would write in other congregational Bibles, particularly like the mainline Protestant or Catholic. Yeah. Yes, they absolutely would. Oh, okay. yeah. Or they will put um, gospel tracts in them. So this was part of my, uh, my doctoral dissertation. Was um, where you put gospel tracts. So anything that is seen as as unclean, meaning unchristian, would be a space where you could do that. That could mean another religious space, like Catholic Church. Catholic churches are really, really popular because you can just get into it and just put it there, right? Um, or it could mean like a secular bookstore, or it could mean like a bar, or it could mean a public restroom, right? Anything that is seen as not authentically Christian and that's unclean is fair game. So whoever did that to our Sidor, that's what they were thinking probably. And I would venture to guess that they were not messianic. I would venture to guess that they were uh, they were some flavor of probably evangelical Christian. Now, I'm not trying this to, to, to bag on evangelical Christianity here. When we talk about evangelical Christianity, we are talking <laughs> we're talking about somewhere in the the the, the magnitude of five hundred million people in the world, right? I think the numbers for Pentecostals is like themselves are like two hundred fifty million. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of people in the world. This is an enormous group of people, and are all evangelical like this? No, absolutely not. But evangelical, there are aspects of evangelical culture and Christian Christian culture in general that are read in this really aggressive way. And so that's when you start to see things like this. But yeah, they absolutely would do something like that in non other spaces. Yeah. Is okay. it appropriation if Jews for Jesus blow the shofar during the month of Elul? Because uh, Rabbi Daniel in Irvine just experienced, like they stopped traffic and five of them got out of their cars and blew the shofar. I'm going to say, was it in front of a synagogue? No. It was just randomly? Yep, they held up traffic, they took out shofars. Yeah. I'm gonna say, is he watching? Is he see me like equivocate about this? And that's no, going just about his story. Oh, okay. okay. About <laughs> six, like six hours ago. <laughs> and so Jenna, Jenna asks, is it a is it appropriation if uh Jews for Jesus get out, block traffic, and blow the shofar to welcome the month of Lul? And I'm actually gonna say a category, I'm gonna give a categorical answer here. And it's yes. The reason is because the Jews for Jesus are explicitly interested in harming the Jewish community by converting Jews. He Other, wears he wears his kippah in public. Yeah. So okay, so if they saw him wearing the kippah, then they could have been a direct like thing. Yeah. But so but even if they didn't, even if they didn't know he was there, yeah, Jews for Jesus, and this is again one messianic congregation or, or organization, which is heavily backed by numerous evangelical Christian organizations. They, I would call it that because their intent is to both obscure what Judaism actually is. Many other messianic communities don't want to do that. They're just like, we're messianic and that's our thing. You can go be Jewish. That's okay. 
Jews for Jesus aren't interested in doing that. Jews for Jesus are interested in saying, this is Judaism, and Judaism should have always followed Jesus, and the Jews are wrong, and we're going to convert them. And so we're going to go out, and we're going to show that we're here by blowing a shofar in Irvine or wherever, and completely snarling traffic. Yeah, not only is that a form of appropriation and a form of, I wouldn't say cultural violence, but also it's really obnoxious. Yeah. <laughs> And, that, and I'm worried that that's going to reflect badly on. Let me ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll comment a question. <clears throat> if you blow a shofar in a synagogue or even a messianic or whatever, a holiday, it's a shofar. But if I take that same ram's horn and use it to wake up my neighbors to irritate with them, I wouldn't say it's a shofar. I'd say it's a ram's horn. I mean, you could use a seashell too. If you have, or a trumpet or a teacher, yeah, or, a, a, or a, 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 a paper towel roll, you could do the same yeah. thing. But, like, I, I don't, that, that's not, I, that would just make you a bad neighbor. I, but, but, if, but if someone who was not Jewish had a ram's horn and went and did that in front, of, in front of their Jewish neighbors, then you have an issue, right? Because then, yeah, it's possible they're just like a bad neighbor and they just happen to have this thing. But no, probably there's a there's intent there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we can move on. Move on. Okay. So one of the ways that Messianic Jews and Messianic believers become involved with Messianic Judaism is through holidays. So again, misconception among uh, the mainstream Jewish community is that mainstream Jews are tricked into this and then they become Messianic Jews and, and, and they just join these churches and continue to pretend. And the answer to that, that that's not entirely correct. In fact, I don't know the actual numbers, but I would say, if not most confidence in these organizations and in these synagogues, most of them are probably not ethnically Jewish and converted. Most of them are probably Gentile believers, right? And one of the ways that they get, uh, that they make this entrance into Jewish practice is through holiday celebrations. And they do this through a number of ways. They could be Gentile, Gentile usually Christians, who have family or friends who are Jewish, and they go to a Seder, and they're like, this was amazing. What an amazing spiritual experience. I wonder if there's anything like that that I could be a part of without becoming Jewish. And one of the reasons it's so big right now is through the magic of the internet and find that, right? So, but this is so so they go to these holidays and they they participate in this. Another way that they may enter into this sort of practice via the holidays is that there is a degree of cultural appropriation within churches where all sorts of churches, I've seen them, I've seen, I've seen this, of course, in evangelical churches, but I've seen this in Catholic churches. I've seen this and once United Church of Christ, which is the most progressive church out there and very much does not want to be seen as culturally appropriate. Very, very much doesn't. I've seen them do satyrs, right? So, uh, or Christian satyrs, right? So there will be people who are members of these congregations and their congregation decides to hold a Christian seder because that's what Jesus did at the Last Supper. That's not what Jesus did at the Last Supper. There was no seder at the Last Supper. Uh, there would not be seders as we can understand it for another couple hundred years. That's something that was developed later on. But in any event, this is frequently done in, in mainstream normative churches and people may participate in these and say, oh wow, that really spoke to me spiritually. And therefore enter it into good faith. Maybe it wasn't good faith to establish that seder in the first place, but the participants are entering into it, at least within their own context, in good faith. So that's one way people might get into it. This is especially true of the pilgrimage holidays. So what are the pilgrimage holidays in Judaism? Uh, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Yeah. So why would Messianic believers be interested in Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot? What do you think? Yeah, they're biblically they're biblically mandated feasts. Um, particularly, they have resonance within Christian narrative. Pesach, in particular, the whole thing goes down over Passover. But so does Shavuot. Shavuot is when the Pentecost happens. I talked about Pentecost a couple weeks ago. The Holy Spirit comes down and 
basically creates a bunch of believers through its language. Um, that was a way to describe it, right? Um, so, so, and you'll hear Christians refer to these holidays. They'll refer to them, you see them refer to Sukkot as the Feast of Booths or the Feast of uh, Tab, or no, no, Feast of Booths. You'll hear them refer to Shavuot as the Feast of Tabernacles, right? Um, you'll hear them refer to, or no, I have that backwards. I have that backwards. They're, they use booths and tabernacles. Uh, interchangeably, they're both Sukkot, that's right. Um, there's another one that they refer to Shavuot as, I forget. Weeks, I yes, the Feast of Weeks, thank you. Hey. They'll refer to Shavuot as the Feast of Weeks. They go, here's one actually that we use, though. So we use this. They'll refer to Pesach as the Feast of the Passover. And we call it Passover. We still use we we use that, right? But anyway, because there is resonance with these particular um with these particular holidays, because there's resonance, Christian resonance, this is sort of how people enter into it. And this is how, at least in at least in marking these holidays, I see all the questions I'll get to in a moment. At least in marking these holidays, this is how messianic believers in the 1970s, 1960s, 1980s. This is how they got involved in this because they're like, well, Jesus celebrated the Feast of Weeks. Jesus celebrated the Passover. Then we should do that too. And that's how they entered into this. Um, I'll let open some questions. Well, I, when you talk about these particular holidays, uh, the harvest festival, we borrowed from somebody before us. Yeah. yeah. Whereas Rosh Hashanah, I don't, and Yom Kippur, I don't believe that happened. Yeah, and you're 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 noticing that the, the again gray area here. What is appropriation? What is syncretism? All religion develops its way, and so we can look at messianic the development of messianic Judaism and say that this is a syncretic tradition in America that is inevitable. Oh, oh what did you have? Okay. Yeah. 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 With regards to Passover. Do the Christians also call it the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Because I think I've heard that from both Christians and Jews. Yeah. <laughs> Christian, well, while their well, Passover technically encompasses two separate holidays in technicality, um, Christians tend to be the few who actually like talk about them as separate things. Because you'll see the Feast of Unleavened they'll talk about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of the Passover. Yeah. And I want to add, as they are welcome to, because it is their scripture also. It is their interpretation. They have a different interpretation. And I don't know, we're talking about something that happened 2,000 years ago, right? So at some point, we have to, at least, anyway, I, I personally, I don't want to get bogged down in whether or not 2.5 billion people in the world do or don't have a right to that scripture. Um, but the problem is when, and you hear this, when you'll hear certain Christian communities or Christian individuals who say that these are two separate holidays, and therefore the Jewish holiday of Pesach is a quote-unquote Talmud convention, right? Which is a meaning not authentic and not, you know, sometimes outright evil. And that's sometimes you'll hear. You'll hear that oftentimes. But I think you disagree. Go ahead. Oh, no. Oh, no? Okay, you look like you disagree with me. Okay. Any other questions before I move on? I was Okay. Yeah, Talmudic can be considered a slur. Yeah. Okay. So Alexis asked if if Talmudic can be can be considered a slur. So yeah. Um. One of the things that we've seen, and this is always, this is actually, this has been a case for a long time. There were Talmud uh, copies of the Talmud that were berbered as heretical during the medieval period. We had these uh, what were called disputations, where rabbis were forced during the medieval period again. Uh, were forced to argue and debate with priests, but were not allowed to use the Talmud, Mishnah, Gemara, right, as part of their argumentation about whether or not what is better Christianity or Judaism. So this is there's a long history of rabbinic Judaism being vilified because of the use of the oral law, because of the use of Mishnah, Gemara, and then like you know uh, other responses and so on and so forth. And so where it manifests in sort of a lay sense today is that you'll hear people say that, and John mentioned, oh, you are giving Passover as an example, that there are two holidays. There's the Feast of Unleavened Bread and, yeah, and the Feast of the Passover, and they're two separate things, and by conflating them, rabbinic Jews, meaning us, meaning almost all Jews in the world, um, basically are not doing something that is uh, truly biblical, and 
And this is where it starts to get really insidious. And therefore means that they are not the authentic Jews, heirs of the house of Israel, you know, connected to the Israelites. And this is when you get into all sorts of like conspiracy theories that could cause our conspiracy theory, which we will talk about when we talk about Judaism and race. Um, yeah. So we got we just get so far down and stuff, but I love it. I love it. I love it. I, I don't expect Sean says we spend my expect class. No, I don't. <laughs> this, this is what's gonna allow us to make this allow this class to go over the course of a year or longer. And so I'm I'm I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. Um so 1960s to 1990s, you see a rejection of rituals, and this is the the beginning of uh, Messianic Judaism. And the Jews for Jesus are kind of at the forefront of this because they are established by evangelical pastors who their intent is to convert Jews. And they think that they're going to do this by going to Jews who aren't in the know and saying, hey, you can believe in Jesus. And they think they can do this because there's a lot of Jews in the 1960s and 70s who are not in the know. And there's a lot of Jews, just like everybody else, who have sort of basically washed out of the 1960s and the counterculture and find themselves like over, you know, uh, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And dinner for Timothy Leary didn't work for them. And everyone has this, there's a spiritual void. This is true of Jews as well as Gentiles. And Messianic Judaism, this early period, will pick up on these folks and try to convert them and succeed in some instances. Um, it's not just Messianic Judaism, though. It's also like the Jesus People Movement, so Calvary Church and like the Vine Movement and, and other organizations as well. Also the Hare Krishnas, also the Self-Realization Fellowship. All these organizations are going to do this during this period. But because Jews through Jesus and some of the other early ones are started by Christians, and that's true, that is true, it's going to reject ritual and see ritual, which is part and parcel of Jewish practice, as being superfluous and not necessary for salvation. Um, but I want to stress two things. First of all, that's not what Messianic Judaism looks like today. Second of all, I personally believe, and you can take this as a great grain of salt, right? But I think it would have happened that way. And it, ultimately, because we live in this sort of, like, pluralistic society, ostensibly it's supposed to be, and Christians were going to become interested in Judaism and they met Jews, and that's sort of how it happens. About rejecting ritual in this period, isn't this the uh, classic reform Judaism sort of, re sort of rejected ritual, and now we're recovering from it? Uh, yeah, so, so classic reform Judaism absolutely did, although they did like a hundred years earlier, or not a hundred years earlier, but much earlier, um, I would say that during this period, you still had to have the emphasis on classical reform, the classical reform movement, but reform synagogues are going to start moving in a more traditional uh, form of practice during the 1970s. Yeah. At least that's what you tend to see. <laughs> well, the reason I said my mother's from uh, classical reform Judaism, um, worship all over our temple, you guys say more for those who know about it. Um, and she used to tell me that we no longer have to solve the Passover because Israel's pretty, and then Hanukkah was the big deal. Yeah, well, I, Rabbi Young wants something really funny to me. He's like, um, traditionally, the big Jewish holidays historically are Yom Kippur, Pesach, and Shavuot, right? But in the United States, it's the high holidays, Passover, and Hanukkah, right? And I, you know what? I have another section of this class that's on like, Happy holidays, right? And we'll talk about that then. Um, I, yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, but anyway, uh, to sort of go back to this, and I want to stop in a couple minutes because I want to show you something really cool, um, or at least that I think is cool. I just want to sort of finish briefly by talking about this rejection of rituals and how this changes. As Judaism in America, particularly Reform Jews, becomes more comfortable with ritualization, and as Judaism in America, Reform, conservative, and orthodox, and it is largely Ashkenazi, that's part of the discourse at this point, point uh, becomes more well-known, if well-known imperfectly, becomes more well-known, the rituals start to pick up because Messianic communities, which at this point are no longer just the Jews for Jesus, but are other communities, they see these practices and they're like, wait a minute, if this is what Jews are doing, then we need to be doing this because we are Jewish believers, you know? So we have to do this as well. This is how you practice Judaism. 
Um, or at the very least, they'll say, if you are a ethnically Jewish Messianic believer, you are obligated to do these rituals, but the other the Gentiles in the community are not. But when ethnically uh, Jewish believers start practicing these in these communities, other people are like, oh, you have a spiritual connection to this. I want to do this as well. So there's that syncretism that comes into play, right? And so ritual becomes part of the messianic practice. And, and there begin, begin to see sort of like a, uh, uh, through this like normalization within the larger uh, American community with traditional Judaism, there is more of a specific identification of the Jewishness of Jesus. And what I mean by that is that as Gentiles became more familiar with Judaism, I would say at least until about 2014, some things changed then, but as Gentiles become more familiar with Judaism, they become more comfortable with Judaism, and they're like, well, you know what? Maybe we can see Jesus as truly Jewish. I know we were talking about some people who don't believe that on Shabbat. We'll get to that. But but at least during the as ritual rituals are sort of taking on, this is how people are thinking. And there's a desire among Messianic communities to move away from evangelicalism, to see evangelicalism as actually a problem. Um, as, 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 as something that is harmful to Judaism, because they want to see themselves as truly Jewish, but they just believe in Jesus, right? That's how they want to see themselves, and evangelicalism, from their perspective, is not truly Jewish. It's all fine and good, but they say we don't want to do that, and so there's a, a desire to basically move away from traditional evangelicalism. All right. Uh, how's, our, how's our time? You have about three minutes. I have about three minutes. Okay, so I'm going to show you something really cool real fast. Um, I, I, I brought it today and I don't want to forget it. So I want to, but next week, oh, oh yeah, let's do that. Let's show, show this video. Okay, I have this really cool video, a really interesting video I want to show you. We talk about whether or not it's appropriation. This is messianic dancing, uh, Jewish dancing. If it actually if, if it plays, if it plays. If it doesn't play, I will make sure that I send a link to people or I get a link sent to you. Right. Oh, of course it's unresponsive. <laughs> it looks like it may not work. Um, I might have it here on a different link. Yeah, just do it on the YouTube. Video. There we go. Let's try this. <laughs> we have your face on the screen. Your face. Your face. <laughs> it's kind of frozen. So, okay. Let me, I want to just. She's uh, emoting on me. I want to end just by sort of explaining what you saw there. Um, I, you can look at this, and I think it's fair to look at this. This took place, this actually took place in a, uh, it, there was an evangelical church that had a Passover Seder that invited a messianic dance troupe to come. That's where, that's where this took place. Um, and so we can look at that and say, like, that That feels, that definitely feels icky. There is an element of appropriation, and I would agree with you, absolutely. Um, but if you break it down and hurt its short parts, what I find really interesting, so sort of putting the ickiness aside for a moment, what is really fascinating to me is that you see a appropriation of the Hora 
right, of a, of a traditional Jewish folk dance. Um, and you hear sort of like, uh, you hear a uh, Frankish scale music, right, sort of that traditional Yiddish tonality, but with Christian language. And dancing, people dancing the way I've never seen Jews dance in my life. And the question is, well, where does that come from? Why are they dancing like that? That is a form of Pentecostal dancing. So in Pentecostal churches, um, and I mentioned I would talk about Holy Ghost dancing, and, and I'll talk more about that next week because I don't even want to hear about it. But basically, that's sort of a free form type of feeling the Holy Spirit dancing around sort of thing. They're wearing kippot. Yeah, they're wearing kippot. You're right. Um, so, but then there's also more choreographed uh, worship dance that Pentecostals engage in. I will talk more about that next week because I can talk about that for a long time. But what we're seeing here is a is a syncretic fusion, but also an element of appropriation. It exists in both worlds. It is it is both legitimately syncretic, but also appropriated at the same time. And it, it, it's difficult to sort of sit with that. But that is the case. Now, do all messianic congregations do that? No. Again, that was an evangelical church that invited a messianic dance trip. So not all of them do that, but it has become a messianic practice in the more Pentecostally oriented messianic congregations. And we can sort of look at that definitely seen as an appropriation of traditional Ashkenazi folk dancing, but at the same time, there is an element of it that is also traditional American Pentecostal worship dancing, right? And so again, weird gray area. Um, any last minute thoughts? I know we're pretty much right up against the time and not over today. All right. Um, then I will release you all uh, into the wilderness. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for another wonderful class. I look forward to us here for five days. <laughs> I look forward to next week. Oh, uh, next week, we may, we may um, I, I'm not sure if we'll do, we'll continue with this discussion or do something a little bit different. And we're losing a lot of members next week to the choir. So we'll see. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Uh, they'll be in.